naval corvette Arbutus is leaving New Zealand on a routine cruise of the South Pacific. It's one of the regular trips made by units of her Navy to New Zealand's Pacific Island dependencies to show the flag, train naval personnel and assist the Island Territory's administration. New Zealand's island territories are scattered over an area of nearly a million square miles in the southwest Pacific. And without the Navy's help, it would be a difficult area to cover. On this trip, Arbutus is taking island administration officials to the southern and northern Cook groups and to the Tokelau Islands. And the voyage will take three months. A week steaming from New Zealand and our first landfall is a low palm-covered island of the southern Cooks. There are no anchorages here and we lie well out from the island's encircling reef while the natives pull out in their locally built surf boats. They're expert seamen like their forefathers, the ancient Polynesians, who traveled throughout the Pacific in open canoes many centuries ago. All the crew except the duty watch are being taken ashore. It's calm today and a landing on the reef should be relatively easy, but everything depends on the skill of the steersman as he heads the light craft for one of the few gaps in the coral reef. An error of judgment in riding the surf and the boat will be dashed to pieces on the coral. Safely ashore and over the slippery coral to where the headman extends a traditional greeting to the captain. The path to the main village is lined by the local boys' brigade. This is the big day of the year for the islanders and everyone takes a holiday to welcome the navy. The captain's first duty is to inspect veterans of World War I, most of whom served in Egypt. The school children are a little overawed when it comes to their turn. Formal occasions are rare in the Cook Islands and the Polynesians express themselves best through their dancing. The paramount chief of the island, Samuela Ariki, leads off with a real welcome. Something new for most of us and the star turn of the day is a dance by pupils of the village school. The natives' favorite game is cricket, and they soon organize a match against the ship. The village greens is familiar here as in England. The islanders have a magnificent eye for any ball game. They hit out lustily and score an easy win. Softball proves equally suited to their talents, although they haven't played it before this. A rugged open air life and good physique have given them a zest for sport and made them natural athletes. A strictly native game played on the island of Atiu is pua rolling. A pua is a disc of hardwood driven by a grass string wound tightly round its edge. Teams compete to see how many can bowl the pua the full length of a 200 yard track. Points are scored by the man who sends the poor 200 yards down the track and over the finishing line. Centerpiece of an island welcome is the umukai, or native feast, and one is put on for us at every island we visit. It's a matter of pride that everyone should bring a contribution and help prepare the food. Chicken and sucking pig, yam and taro, bananas, oranges and coconuts in many different disguises. And while the food is being prepared, we're entertained with a little informal dancing. The Polynesians like nothing better than entertaining guests and joining in the fun with them.
this is the last island we visit in the Southern Cooks, and the day there is nearly over. The native children bring gifts for the ship down to the beach, and there's nothing more welcome than fresh fruit on a three months voyage. The gifts are typical of the kindness and hospitality of the people of these islands. It may be many months before another ship calls, and there are many sad hearts on shore as we prepare to leave on the next part of the voyage, 600 miles north to the Northern Cooks. Near the Northern Cooks, we pass the New Zealand government schooner, New Golden Hind. The schooners have always been the mainstay of island trading and are still the only ship seen at most of the islands. The Northern Cooks lie in a strategic position just south of the equator and are important for their copra trade. The largest is Penryn Atoll, where we wait offshore for New Golden Hind to arrive and take the administration party and some of our crew through the reef and into the lagoon. A narrow gap in the circular ring of coral forming the atoll is just big enough to allow the schooner through. Inside the reef, all hands keep a watch for the dangerous patches of coral that could rip the bottom from a ship. It's 11 miles across the circular lagoon to the islands perched on the reef on the other side. During World War II, many of these atolls were safe harbour for flying boats, and Allied air bases were set up ashore. New Zealand engineers built this giant airstrip for the United States Army Air Force. It's deserted now, but work goes on as usual for the natives. Pearl shell from the lagoon is worth good money these days. Cleaned up and sent overseas, it's in great demand for buttons and ornaments. European tools and influence have given more variety to the work in the villages today, but the chief source of wealth is still the coconut palm and the valuable copper it produces. The palms bear a rich supply of nuts regularly and often, and the copper yields the valuable coconut oil used in the making of soap and margarine. When the husk has been cleaned off, the hard shell is split open, exposing the white coconut meat, which is copra, the island's most valuable asset that first brought the traders to the Cook Islands. After the whole family has helped in its preparation, the copra is spread in the sun to dry and await the next schooner. New Golden Hind will load the copra for transshipment to New Zealand, and meanwhile she lies snugly tied up inside the lagoon, protected from the open sea by the encircling reef as she unloads stores. Penryn Lagoon is the refuge of the trading schooners during the hurricane season. In the island's economy, the amazing coconut is king. It not only provides the natives with food and their chief source of income, but it's also the basis for many sports. At Puka Puka, we're treated to a coconut husking competition. The husking stakes are hardwood, needle sharp, the slightest error of judgment and a man's hand is ripped open. That's record husking by husky men. And the next item on the program is a palm climbing race. Touch the top and look out for splinters on the way down. The winner gets a great hand from his seconds. And then there's a traditional puka puka inter-village wrestling match. Any man brought to the ground is out till a whole team is eliminated. It's Olympic rules with the added hazards of coconut palms, a hard coral mat, and no holds barred. The winning team limps back to its corner, a little the worse for wear. Down at the beach, the canoes are waiting to take us out over the reef to the ship.
Our visit to the Cook Islands is over, and our Butis will steam far to the west to the Tokelaus, which lie near the equator just north of Samoa. The Tokelau Islands are three coral atolls lying a day steaming apart, and with a total population of 1,500. At Whakaofa, the southernmost of the three, the natives come out in their outrigger canoes to take us ashore. Going ashore with us from the ship are members of the Samoan administration, which looks after the Tokelau's for the New Zealand government. Leader of the party is Colonel Volker, the administrator of Western Samoa. Dr. Loptel, Chief Medical Officer at Samoa, and a Meteorological Officer are also in the party. Each island is equipped with a simple weather recording station, and natives are trained to take readings which are radioed to Samoa and pooled to give a forecast for the area. The administration then decides when it's safe to make canoe trips between islands. This service is greatly appreciated, as many canoes were lost in storms in the old days. As part of his duties, Colonel Volker addresses village meetings on the administration's policy. The internal government of the islands is carried out by the natives themselves through local councils, and this democratic procedure works well. The natives live in clean and well-laid-out villages, and among the houses, fishing nets are a common sight as much of the men's time is spent fishing in the lagoon and in the sea. The only other source of food is the inevitable coconut, and as with the northern cooks, copra is the chief source of income for the islands. But although they are prepared for eating in a variety of ways, coconuts and fish alone make an unbalanced diet. The islanders' food is short of many essentials, and to make up deficiencies, the administration brings flour and other foodstuffs to the islands. The supplies are brought ashore from Arbutus together with goods for trading, such as tobacco, soap and clothing. At the trading post, the administration pays the natives for their last shipment of copra. They are given the ruling Samoan market price without any deduction for shipping, and any profits the administration makes from the resale of the copra help to pay for the island's medical services, education and public works. With the money from their copra, the islanders buy trade goods, and soap seems to be in good demand today. The people also trade the fans and mats for which the Tokelaus are famous, and which they export along with their copra. They're an industrious people of Polynesian ancestry, and the young men of the islands are fine physical specimens. The children are as happy, healthy and inquisitive as children anywhere in the world. But our administration party has arrived just in time to try and save the life of a girl with a perforated appendix. The medical officer decides to operate immediately, assisted by the leading sick birth rating from the ship. The anaesthetic is administered by the island's native medical practitioner and trained native nurses help during the operation. It's delicate surgery in primitive conditions, and the girl's relatives watch anxiously. The operation is a success, and the girl's life is saved. The administration's policy of training the people of these remote islands in modern techniques and providing every possible up-to-date service has raised the standard of health considerably and saved many lives. The doctor gives final instructions to the native medical practitioner for care of the patient after we leave. The cruise is drawing to a close, and the people of the Tokelaus bring gifts to show their appreciation of our visit and all it's meant to them. The village policeman makes a personal gift of a coconut fiber hat he's made for the administrator. The celebrations wind up with a traditional Tokelau dance by the young men of the island.
Here, as at every port of call, the people of the Pacific Islands have made us welcome. It's the end of a happy and successful trip as the canoes leave the shore to take us over the reef to the waiting ship. Another Pacific cruise ends, and our Butus will return to her base in New Zealand. The cruise has helped in training naval personnel and in the work of the island's administration. Above all, it has extended goodwill between New Zealand and the people of her island territories.